Shana Tova, everybody. Dory and my children join me in wishing you a happy, healthy, sweet new year. This year and this Rosh Hashanah, I want to talk to all of you about the importance of masks. Not the masks that some of you are wearing and some of you are not wearing, not the masks that have become a part of our lives. Rather, the masks that most of us, thank God, have never had to use, but every single one of us are prepared for. In case the sudden loss of cabin pressure, oxygen masks will drop from above your seats. When they do, be sure to place your own oxygen masks on before you help others. All of us have heard this when ever flying any airplane anywhere. And this rule is counterintuitive even though it is so very practical. Were I to be traveling with my 84-year young mother, or if I were traveling with my wife or my kids, or even if I was near someone who looked like they were challenged, my instinct would be to put the mask on them before myself. But that would be dangerous. Because if, God forbid, I were on an airplane that lost air pressure, and oxygen mask came down, I could lose consciousness if I was too busy helping someone else before my own mask went on. And if I lost consciousness, I couldn't help anybody else. I'd be useless to others who might need me. This Rosh Hashanah, I want to talk about marking a time in all of our lives to put our own oxygen masks on first. I want to focus on the needs to help ourselves, because I am confident that if we help ourselves, we'll be so much better at helping others. In the aftermath of this pandemic, with all of its ups and downs and twists and turts, turns and false endings that we have lived with for the last 18 months, what I have noticed in our community and in our world is a deterioration of emotional hygiene. Now, ironically, no one stopped taking care of their physical bodies. We didn't stop brushing our teeth during the pandemic. In fact, we washed ourselves more, not less, because of COVID. But we have not been nearly as fastidious about taking care of our minds, our souls, and our spirits during this time. Guy Winch, who is an Israeli-born but American-trained and educated world expert on this topic of emotional hygiene, explains pretty brilliantly that even when a small child falls off a chair, she knows it is okay to cry, and she does so. She knows that she is allowed to get ice to, wound her, to cover her wound or her bruise. She knows that if she's hurt, she can ask for help. And all of us know, kind of intuitively, when we have a cut, when it requires a Band-Aid, and when it needs stitches. But I don't think we can say the same thing about our emotional health. Why haven't we prioritized modeling emotional hygiene for ourselves, our kids, and our community? Why haven't we made our psychological states as valuable as our physical health? and cleanliness and well-being. This summer, when schlepping luggage somewhere, somehow, I'm not quite sure, I hurt my shoulder pretty badly, and it got very sore. So when I got home from Israel, I went to see Dr. Jeff Pavel. Dr. Pavel is located at 500 Grand Avenue. He takes most major insurances. <laughs> Beautiful waiting room. He was trained at Johns Hopkins and in Buffalo. Jeff is a great guy. Jeff gave me an injection in my arm. It helped a little bit. And then he teamed me up with this physical therapist that I think many of you might even know. Her name is Tara. And she worked on my arm and she made it much, much better. Not perfect, but better. And she explained to me very clearly, David, this is going to be a journey. It's going to be a process for you. And sure enough, my shoulder's a lot better. I can do this. I couldn't do this a few weeks ago. Now, during the same time, even in the last few months and perhaps the last time of COVID in the last years, 
I've been wounded. I've been hurt. There have been moments that have deflated me. I have suffered rejection. I've suffered loss. I've gone through different forms of trauma. I've been overcome by profound disappointment and sadness. But when those things happened, I didn't see a doctor who gave me a shot. I didn't have physical therapy for two or three days a week like I did with my sore shoulder. Why? Why haven't we made taking care of ourselves and putting our own oxygen masks on paramount? Because what good are we to our spouses, to our parents, to our children, to our friends, to our colleagues, if we're not good to ourselves? And what good are we to the world that needs us if we're walking around hurt and in pain? There are two main sources that I want to focus on this morning that can inflict emotional and psychological wounds that I want to take a deeper dive in. Rejection and trauma. And I want to unload some of these case by case, but I want to use the narrative of the Torah reading that we read on Rosh Hashanah as a shared narrative to have all of us better understand. So Abraham is blessed with the second child, but the first child of his wife, Sarah. Sarah is so relieved that she had this baby. And she doesn't like having the handmaiden, who was Abraham's first wife, Hagar, around, and their child, Ishmael. So Sarah cowardly tells Abraham to take care of her problem. So Abraham gives some food, some water, a few shekels to Hagar, his wife, and Ishmael, his son, and he banishes them. He sends them out. But not to be seen again by Sarah, by Isaac, by Abraham. Now, Ishmael and Hagar are totally bereft, and they are heartbroken. The text tells us explicitly that they are in the wilderness, and they are lost. They are crying. Now, it's not a wild stretch of the, imagina of the imagination to consider that what is hurting Hagar, what she is suffering through, is a moment of painful rejection. After all, Abraham chooses her, meaning Sarah, over Hagar and Isaac over Ishmael. And if we could jump into Hagar's mind, she might be saying to herself, maybe I'm not attractive enough for Abraham. Maybe I wasn't smart enough for him. Maybe I wasn't sexy enough for him. Maybe I didn't take care of him enough. Maybe I didn't make the foods he enjoyed enough. Maybe I wasn't funny enough. Maybe I wasn't thoughtful enough. Maybe I didn't make him enough of a priority to have him keep us around. Rejection stings, and it stings badly. And all of us are rejected in different ways and in different manners. We're rejected by spouses and partner. We're rejected on the dating scene. We get rejected from employers and from business opportunities. We get rejected when they don't hire us for the particular job, and the job gets rejected when the employee we want to hire doesn't want to work with us. We've been rejected on the playground, and we've been rejected at the middle school dance. And rejection even includes when our parents and our kids don't approve of our choices, when they don't accept our lifestyles, and they don't accept our decisions. And it's a form of rejection that hurts deep inside of us. There was a group of social scientists that did an analysis mapping the brain and its pathways during an exercise of rejection. And what's fascinating is that they found out that the same pathways that light up when we are physically hurt are activated during rejection. So that means that when we fall and break a bone, it can hurt exactly the same as a feeling of any form of rejection. Now, I have broken bones in my life. I broke my ankle twice. I broke every bone on my left hand. I don't remember the pain of them whatsoever. I remember walking around in a cast, but I don't remember the pain of them. But I've been rejected many times in my life. I was rejected 20 and 30 and even 40 years ago, and the sting is still fresh decades later. And I bet it is for you too. But eventually, Hagar and Ishmael have their spirits replenished. 
And I like to think that they got to that place through a little technique that I want to share with you called self-affirmations. Now, these aren't Saturday Night Live Stuart Smalley self-affirmations where you look in the mirror and say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. That worked on Saturday Night Live. But I want to suggest something different and something honest. What I want you to do when you're feeling that sting of rejection and you start to go through that spiral of not feeling worthy and good and recognized, I want you to find three attributes or characteristics in your life that you can confidently say you do well. Don't make them unrealistic. Don't make them below the line. Make them something you know that you're proud of and that you can do well. Write them down on a piece of paper and then expand by writing a paragraph about those characteristics. And then journal it. Or maybe put it in an email that you end up sending to yourself. This small act of dedicating time for yourself and focusing on three simple skills or qualities that you have will remind you of your self-worth and of your value. I'd like to imagine Hagar sitting near Ishmael by a well, thirsty, hungry, despondent, and sad. And then she looks down and she begins the process of journaling. And she says, you know, I'm feeling this incredible pain, but I know that I'm a doting mother. And I know that I'm a trusted friend. And I know that I have a deep and abiding faith in God. And she is reminded of those traits and of those characteristics. She writes them and expounds on them and it buoys her spirits. It buoys her head, literally. And she sees off in the horizon solutions and hope so that she and her son can live in health and in happiness. Rejection is very real for all of us in some form or another. And it is very painful. It can hurt as much as an open wound that requires stitches. But we begin the process of stitching that wound with honest self-affirmations that can be journaled or emailed to remind ourselves the sacred task of what we are individually and collectively worth. Whenever we face any form of rejection, small or large, put your own oxygen mask on first. Log your redemptive qualities and get out of that rut that rejection can point us down. Every time we gather on these Yamim Noraim, on these holidays, inevitably, some of us sit here changed people. And we're changed because we have endured a trauma in the past year. Something that changed from the last time we were here to when we're here now, that makes us the same person, but different on the inside. Over the past 18 months, we have endured collective traumas. We share a language of a trauma, all of us, called COVID. And the thing about trauma is it's usually accompanied by anxiety. And the two of those, they are a vicious pair. You know, Isaac, in the Torah portion, he endured a very serious trauma that's hard to comprehend. He almost died at the hands of his own father in an incident known as the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. He ascends the mountain hand in hand with his father, and then he is almost killed by his father and he descends the mountain alone. The only time he ever sees his father again is after he's dead, where he comes to bury him. His relationship with his father is over, but the trauma and the post-traumatic stress just beginning for him. Isaac's life is radically different than any of his biblical peers. Isaac doesn't wander or move. He stays in Canaan, known as Israel, for all of his life. Isaac is the only one of our biblical patriarchs and leaders who had only one spouse. He is afflicted with a physical ailment. And most psychologists and perhaps psychiatrists could explain and point all of this to the trauma that Isaac had to endure. Thank God, I, I don't know anyone who almost died at the hands of their parents, at least on purpose. 
and I assume most of you can say the very same. But every single person sitting under any one of these three tents have withstood traumas and wrestled with stress as a result of that trauma. Maybe you lost a parent when you were young. Maybe you buried a child. Maybe you were diagnosed with a terrible illness, or maybe someone you love was diagnosed with a terrible illness. Maybe you suffered through a broken heart. Maybe you had to go on unemployment. Maybe you had to feel the shame of using food stamps. Maybe you were physically changed after an accident. Maybe you've had to go through a separation or a divorce. Maybe when you were young or even when you were older, your trust was abused by someone who shouldn't have. Maybe you inherited a family that you are ashamed of. We have all had experiences that are different than Isaac's, but they're all traumas that have affected us. In the wake of whatever our personal trauma is, we are given the chance to choose whether we're gonna solely suffer from what we will know as post-traumatic stress, or whether we will mature from what I will call post-traumatic growth. This concept of post-traumatic growth was introduced by two psychologists named Calhoun and Tedeschi, and they explain it very simply as follows. When we take a challenging crisis in our life and we turn it into a positive moment, that is post-traumatic growth. Now, when I say something like this, it probably sounds to most of you like something very nouveau, like West Coast, Los Angeles, in touch, self-helpy, avant-garde kind of thing. But this concept is as old as humanity itself. The Jewish people invented the idea that suffering can lead to positive change. And it was such a compelling idea that the Christians adopted it as their central theology. So what does post-traumatic growth actually look like? Well, here's an example, and it comes from our congregation. Dave and Anne-Marie Plotkin had their worst nightmare come to life when the very day before their eldest son Max's fourth birthday, they were given the diagnosis that Max had stage four B-cell lymphoma, a cancer so rare they had never seen a case of it at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dave and Anne-Marie were devastated. But after the initial shock and the fear, Dave and Anne-Marie galvanized. And they created what's called the Max Cure Fund. And then they created the Max Cure Foundation. In a very short time, they raised $1 million to fund laboratory work for this very rare and unheard of cancer. To date, since that time, the Max Cure Foundation has enabled more than 600 kids, because of that research, to go into remission from their cancer. Dave and Anne Marie developed a program called Dunk Your Kicks, where they take gently used shoes and they then repurpose them or recycle them. And they get $1 for every shoe that's been collected. Close to 1 million shoes have been collected. You all can do the math. Now, when I called Dave and Anne Marie to prepare some of the details for these thoughts with you today, I caught them moving their son, Max, into his first year of college at the University of Wisconsin. Go Badgers. What a beautiful ending that illustrates PTG, post-traumatic growth. If we were to focus on COVID just for a moment, which is a language all of us speak. 88% of people said in the thick, the thick of the pandemic, that they had feelings of serious trauma as a result of COVID that were related to homeschooling, loss of job, and serious health concerns. But 88%, those exact same respondents said that they have noticed positive improvements in their family relationships, and 88% of the 100 responded that their family life had improved and they had a greater appreciation for life as a whole. 74% expressed that they had spiritual growth as a result of COVID. 
and the trauma that this pandemic has given us. That is post-traumatic growth. Every single one of us are like Isaac in some way or another. We've all suffered some kind of trauma. The only differential is where that trauma happened, when that trauma happened, and how that trauma happened. But we all had it. And it's up for all of us to decide whether we're going to take that trauma and carry it around as a heavy backpack in our lives, or whether we're going to transform that weight into PTG, post-traumatic growth. Take inventory of your trauma. Maybe it's something recent. Maybe it's something from your childhood, even. Think of how it shaped you and how you can transform that from a moment of stress into growth. Now, not every stress, not every moment of trauma has to be as acute as cancer was for Dave and Anne Marie. And not every form of growth has to be setting up a foundation. They don't have to be so grandiose. But each of us can find ways and vehicles and small advances that we can make that will change that stress from trauma that weighed us down to personal growth that will lighten us. And through that process, we're going to be putting our own oxygen mask on first. Rosh Hashanah is a holiday that requires us not only to love the other, but in order to love the other, we have to love ourselves. We can't love the other if we don't show compassion for ourselves. We can't help others breathe if we don't put our own oxygen mask on first. When I look out, and I can see pretty clearly, even to the very end of that tent and the end here, and I see family and friends and a community that I have been blessed to be a part of now for 15 years, I see the beautiful sandwich generation that exists. Kids that were here 19 years ago in my first year, holding their own kids, snuggled up next to their parents again. And I see people who are caring for their kids and caring for their parents, and adult children who are caring for their aging parents while caring for their kids. And all of you are doing this while wondering how we're gonna come out of this pandemic and what their professional trajectory is gonna look like and their physical health and what tomorrow has to bring. And let me tell you, all of that alone is a full-time job and it is exhausting. But in all of that time of caring for kids and parents, caring for people in our community, caring for the person sitting next to us, have we taken the time to put our own oxygen mask on first and care for our own emotional hygiene. Once, there was this man who came to see the rabbi and he was depressed and dejected and sad. And he had tears in his eyes and he said, Rabbi, I can't get happy. I am so sad, I'm in this terrible funk and depression, I've been in for months and I can't get out of it, I need your help. Please, try and cheer me up. I've tried everything, I've prayed every day for two months, Rabbi, it didn't work. I've read the Torah every single day for six months, Rabbi, it didn't help me. Rabbi, I've tried exercising to no avail. I cannot get happy. And the rabbi in this very self-congratulatory tone says, I know exactly what you need. You need to go make an appointment with Chuckles the Clown. Chuckles the Clown is the best clown out there. I have never met anyone in the world who has ever met Chuckles the Clown and who wasn't taken from a moment of sadness into happiness. Every person I know who's met Chuckles laughs and enjoys life and will surely get you out of your depression. And as soon as the rabbi said in this swagger, this comment, the man just fell into inconsolable tears. He came up for a moment for air and he said, Rabbi, you don't understand. I am Chuckles the Clown. All of us at times are Chuckles. All of us are looking out for others and putting their oxygen masks on in all these different ways possible. But have we spent time putting our own oxygen mask on first? Today is the perfect time to prioritize our emotional health and our mental hygiene. It's a time for us to journal our merits when we're feeling rejected 
and to remind ourselves of our personal self-worth. It's a time for all of us to register and name our traumas and to find ways to change them into growth instead of stress. It's a time for all of us to grow. Today is a reminder for us to make space, to make a place, and to allow us to take leaps of faith and deep breaths into that oxygen mask and to realize that by helping ourselves, we will then be able to help others. Ultimately, that is what this day of renewal and being able to start again is all about. May that be God's will. Amen.